So this is The Power of the Trumps and Pips by Camille Elias. Um, this is an omnibus edition of this book. So she originally published it as The Power of the Trumps and then The Power of the Pips as two separate volumes. Uh, this is combined into one. And I first learned about Camelia Elias probably through Tom Benjamin. I know he's taken some of her classes and really, you know, admires her. Um, and I was intrigued by the way he spoke about her as being a little bit rebellious, a little bit nonconformist, um, and having people sort of think for themselves when they do tarot readings rather than just memorizing meanings. Yay, love that. Um, I had signed up for her newsletter a while ago, and I have to say, I find her newsletter a bit bombastic and a bit obnoxious. Um, the way she talks about herself and her approach. Um, I feel like she's being a bit dramatic at times. I feel like she's like trying to be avant-garde, trying to be controversial for the sake of being controversial. Um, so I don't know, take her newsletter, I guess, with a grain of salt is what I'm getting at if you do sign up for it. Um, but I have to say this book is pretty good. Um, it's not quite so in your face. And it's interesting because it's basically a philosophy book that's using tarot to convey philosophical approaches. Um, so it is definitely not like a dictionary of card meanings. If you're looking for that, you're looking in the wrong place. Um, she, the, the structure of this is that she gives you sort of chapters with sample questions and then she uses readings to sort of talk about how to approach reading in an open manner so not pulling in all of your learned associations but really opening up the reading to think for yourself and to really tie the reading back to the question above all else answer the damn question read the damn cards right um there you go all right, so I want to read to you a bit out of this out of this book and just give you some examples of what she's talking about here. Um, so again, uh, in the beginning of the book, um, she says, considering the power of the function of the Trumps over their symbolic and random accommodation is more dynamic and interesting as the function of visually representing something opens the gate towards observing the subtle power of the obvious, right? So throw away your memorized meanings and consider the function of what a pope does. What's a hanged man doing, right? He's hanging. Why is he up there? What does the sun do? What function does it serve? You know, how does it operate in our lives, um, et cetera. Uh, she says, as with all my teaching and writing, at the heart of it is a simple invitation. Think the way that bursts open your perception. Don't think in terms of received perception, right? Don't just regurgitate what somebody else told you that they interpreted that card to be. Um, figure it out on your own. Interpret it on your own. And then she goes on to some examples. So I'm going to read you the first, the first one from a chapter called Your Luck is Made. And she's focusing on the Wheel of Fortune in this chapter. Um, so she says, what, do, what you call being lucky is subject to conditions that change. What you call being unlucky is subject to conditions that change. So what's happening here? Three creatures are caught in a wheel and they spin so fast that you can't even see their faces anymore. Is that lucky? Is that unlucky? We don't know. But we do know this, if you go too fast or for too long under conditions that dehumanize you, it's not good. If you identify too much with what you're being caught up in, it's not good. If you have no sense of distinct power because you're at, at it with everyone else, it's not good. And so then she talks about a reading in here. I will uh, go back to my card so you can see these. Okay, so we're talking about this reading here. So we've got the Wheel of Fortune the Emperor and the Moon card. So a young man comes to her and says, my girlfriend wants to get married and have children right away, a concerned young man tells you. He wants to know what married life will be like. It will be like hell, I tell him, while pointing to the Wheel of Fortune. But, but that's a sign of being fortunate, is it not? He insists while also pointing to the Emperor. I can decide how things will go, right? Emperor's like in charge, structure. 
I said, well, you can do that, I say to him. You have the power to determine when you've had enough of the routines that dehumanize you. But once caught here in this wheel, your luck is not made if your self-empowering act ends in madness. <laughs> I point to the moon, following the emperor, following the wheel of fortune. Marriage is not for everyone, I say, and children even less. Though most people would disagree. So for you, it's hell. The emperor's eyes go blank. He fancies the marriage, but the children part scares the shit out of him. A clear picture. Um, so you get the, I just wanted to read you one of these because that's kind of her reading style, right? And, I, and I'm not suggesting that it should be mine or that it should be anybody else's, but it is interesting. Um, I think reading things, even that we sort of that brush us the wrong way or, or um, you know, turn us off sometimes can get us to think. And what it makes me think about is, um, you know, while I wouldn't be that harsh, I wouldn't tell somebody that marriage is going to be hell for them. Um, it does give me a sense that, you know, we don't have to like nicer size every single reading. We can give tough news. We can pre present an opposing viewpoint. We can say the thing maybe that the client doesn't want to hear. Um, or we can or we can refuse to agree with them um, if they're coming just to 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 have us agree with them um, if that's not what the cards tell us if not if that's not the the ideas that we get from the reading uh, we don't just have to go along and play nice with it because what's the point of that um, I don't think I don't think tarot should be there in place of therapy but I do think it should be there if you're going to do a tarot reading you should you should kind of cut away your own preconceptions and really look at it in a more clear way. Otherwise, what's the point? You know, you're just telling yourself a story and you're trying to make yourself feel good. And I don't know. I don't think I don't think that that's really an effective use of the tarot. So um, so I appreciate that about the way she she writes. Um, one card in particular that she had me rethinking a little bit was or thinking more about was temperance. And um, if you take the root of that word, temperance, you get temper. Um, and that has to do with, you know, melding and changing the quality of, of something. But it also uh, reflects into the word temporal. So time, changes in time, um, things being temporary uh, and fluctuating. So that was really interesting. Um, let's see what else she talks about. Um, she talks about the downside of daily draws, just drawing a single card for the day because you're not really asking a question. Um, or if you are asking a question, like what's the energy for today going to be? And you draw a single card, it's, it can be kind of vague and you can only really get the information in, in a retroactive way. Like you could look back on your day and say, oh, I see how the Queen of Cups was reflected in this day, or I see how the Two of Wands was reflected in this day. But at the time you're asking that question or drawing that card, how much can that single card really give you um, in terms of information or assistance? It's kind of unclear. And that's how I've always thought about it. Um, I've always thought that, you know, the best way to learn to read tarot is to really ask questions, specific questions. Um, and even if you don't have specific questions, you can make up questions and practice that way. So that's like the downside of daily draws. And then she also talks about the, the difficulty in formulating questions. We often get people who come to us for a tarot reading, or maybe we sit down with the cards ourselves, and we don't really know what we want to ask. We have something that's bothering us or on our minds, but in terms of formulating the, the specific question that we want to ask, that can be a tough challenge. Um, and she gives some techniques for sort of uncovering the question if the person in front of you is struggling or if they're like, I just want a general reading. Um, I tell you what, after reading this book, I'm not giving anybody a general reading about anything ever again <laughs> because it's just, it, it doesn't, um, it's so vague. It's just unclear. It's, it's like useless word salad um, at that point, at least it is to me. And then she talks about the nature of what tarot reading is. So one of the things she says about that is that 
uh, it goes into figuring out how images on cardboard participate in expanding our field of habitual thinking beyond cultural dictations. Um, she talks a lot about cultural norms to cultural dictations and how those things get in our way when we have questions. And so setting all that aside, setting, setting aside our cultural overlays, setting aside our learned meanings, setting aside our learned symboli symbolism, um, and getting out of all that thinking is really what we're trying to do when we go to the tarot for an answer on something or insight. Um, she talks about how the nature of questions can vary from the mundane to the metaphysical and the philosophical. Um, which I've certainly used tarot to answer in an interesting, interesting ways. She says uh, that she's trying to get people who, you know, she, who she teaches or who read her books to get away from cliche, mainstream opinions, and other, quote, natural approaches to thinking. Um, she says, my sole aim is to make you go, why didn't I think of this before? Um, so I find that very helpful. And then further on this topic, reading cards is not about memorization and imitation. It's about improvisation and paying attention. Um, the cards on the table don't show a set out outcome. They point to what is possible. So kind of what I was saying before with Vermont Farm Camp's question, you know, I can't, I can't tell you if this particular sports team is necessarily going to win the league because the league doesn't end for a few more months and there's a lot of variables. Um, so what's possible, what could happen, uh, and that's the same way I approach tarot readings in general, is what's likely, what's possible, what's coming up, um, what do you maybe need to prepare for? Not necessarily what's going to happen, because if you know all of those things, then you can affect the outcome. And maybe you don't have total control over the situation. Maybe you have little control over the situation, but generally you have some influence over the situation or you might be able to avoid the situation, right? So even if you can't change it to a positive thing, maybe you can avoid the negative. Um, you know, just a lot of stuff to like really kind of uh, make you think in this book. And I do appreciate that. Um, one downside of this book um, is that she does uh, mention the the sort of A.E. Waite, uh, Crowley, um, and I don't know if they're the ones who invented this uh, um, approach to using the tarot cards, but the assignment of physical attributes to uh, personality traits is problematic it's racist and sexist and you know she brings that up as like here's an old way to do this and she kind of walks you through doing it and I'm like why are we even talking about this this is outdated and it and it's um, reinforcing those stale cultural links that you rail against in the rest of the book but now you're telling us that this is an okay thing to do so that's my probably main criticism the, of the book she doesn't spend more than a page on that so it's not like a focus of the book but it is i would say a caveat just to know that it's in there um and i would just simply ignore it um so yeah i'm curious if any of you have read this book um if you like this book or if you do not like this book um, like I said, she, she can be a little bit blunt and off-putting in her delivery, um, but for me that's an interesting thing, uh, even in, it, in itself, um, to kind of read through her, uh, through her point of view and then think about how that's making you feel um, or what kind of reactions that's bringing it up and, and then what does that mean, you know, what does that mean for you? Um, yeah, so um, I guess in terms of recommend, not recommend, you make that decision for yourself based on what I've told you. Um, she she is a, a practicing Buddhist, or at least that's one of the um, one of the things that she practices. She practices a bunch of stuff, including witch witchcraft. So, um, but there is a lot of Buddhist philosophy interwoven in this book, and that's probably one of the reasons that it appeals to me personally, um, because she does say a lot of things about you know dismantling the ego and um, setting aside our biases and working on uh, this kind of biases that come up for ourselves in a very direct way and not bullshitting around, um, which is something that you know Buddhism really emphasizes. So I can appreciate that um, as well about her writing.